in the room, so to speak. Thank you for attending today. I'm Ken Baker with Integrated Design Lab. Of course, we're part of the University of Idaho College of Art and Architecture. And today's topic is the architect's business case for energy modeling. And it's, um, I won't say that it's just real near and dear to my heart, but it's been something that um, uh, I've been uh, thinking on and working uh, on a bit for probably 30 plus years. And so I'm gonna share some information with you today about this business case. Yeah, and if anyone cannot hear or cannot see during the presentation, I don't know what to do about the visual if that's bad, but uh, the hearing, please, uh, please let me know. Oops. And as a part of the Integrated Design Lab, uh, right now I'm the interim director, we have uh, Three of us that are full-time and four students in the lab. I don't know if you, uh, how many of you know, but it, it was founded on providing education, research, and outreach to uh, really architects and engineers in uh, the state of Idaho, but it was also founded on um, educating our students so that we have uh, students when they, when they leave the uh, University and the Integrated Design Lab, these are graduate students in engineering and architecture, that they're actually um, capable of doing maybe a little bit more than they would have been with just a college education because they get some real world experience and they get to interact with you folks out there. And so that's a, that's a good thing in my opinion. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Idaho Power because they're sponsoring this session and they sponsor a lot of our work here at the Integrated Design Lab. So if you're in the Idaho Power Service Territory, you're pretty lucky in that um, there are a lot of services we can provide to you that are at no cost to you. Um, and this is one of them. We can help with technical assistance on your project and anything from uh, uh, massing studies to assistance with your doing an energy model, daylighting studies uh, and such. And there's three phases uh, depending. So these are scopes basically depending you know, on what you want to do. And, and uh, we would work with you, write up a scope and get permission from Idaho Power. And in phase three, you can see we can go up to $4,000 of our assistance uh, for you. So this is covering our cost to help you. And since we're at the university, um, I always like to say is that, that our, our, we go, our work goes a long way. Our hourly wage is a little lower than a lot of the private sector consultant wages. So it goes a, a pretty long way in helping you. So take advantage of that. Uh, let's see, I think I, no, sorry, folks. Getting used to this, how that how this works it's a little differently than it usually does for me. Well, we also have some resources here that um, were created, uh, oh, actually several years ago, and we have this building metrics label. And um, honestly, uh, no one ever takes advantage of it. But um, I got to let some more people in here if I can get down to that. Uh, Dylan, can you let people in the room? There's no one in the waiting room. Okay, I, I, I thought I had four people. Anyway, the building methods label, um, I remember when it wa was done and um, it's not used a lot, but it's a very good label system. If you'd like to use it, we can set you up on that. Um, we have a new website that we just uh, two weeks ago put out there. Dylan worked really hard on that, and it's a good website. And all of the work that we do with Idaho Power, uh, you can you can contact us, and you can um, uh, re you can get these resources just by going to the website. It's, it's done really well. So if you haven't checked out our website in a while, please go to. Uh, idlboise.com and check it out. We also have the uh, BSUG, the Building Simulation Users Group. I mean, we've already had one. Dylan presented that. We have Ryan, uh, oh, uh, the 26th. That's uh, today's 25th. Okay. 
that's coming up tomorrow. We have uh, Brian Shorts talking about graphics for Ladybug for early design. And then you can see there's a, a list of other topics coming up and uh, lots of lots of local talent and lots of local speakers there. So we're, we're happy to see that. And the BSOG really, uh, what we're talking about today, the architect's business case for energy modeling. Well, this, this is all about energy, energy modeling. So these, it, if you haven't attended one of these meetings previously, I think it would probably be a, a good event for you to, um, to participate in. There's a lot, of, a lot of dialogue during these events typically and some good presentations. And then we have the Energy Resources Library, uh, this tool loan library up there, and, and it, we still have uh, hundreds of tools that we can lend for diagnostics on uh, buildings. And again, on our website, IDL, um, uh, the IDL website, you can, there, there is a new way to actually view all of these tools. And there's also um, a very good script on how to use the uh, how to use the tools and what tools you may need for certain um, uh, diagnostic work on your building. So Dylan's done a really very, very good job on that. So you can come on our website again, idlboise.com and check, uh, check out tools. And then uh, even during the COVID, we have a way that we can deliver the tools. We have uh, guest parking spaces here at the Idaho Water Center, and we'll just bring the tools down to you in, uh, in your car. And then Idaho Power, of course, has uh, some really good programs for new construction, retrofits, custom projects, and you should uh, check them out at idahopower.com slash business. And with that, we're going to go right into the uh, energy modeling business case. And uh, I said this is near and dear, dear to my heart a little bit. I think in in 86, when I started working for the state, we brought Charles Ely here to talk about DOE 2. And it was a, it was a, a three-day training on DOE 2. And boy, was it difficult, in my opinion. And we had um, several engineers, quite a few engineers in that, in that class. But I just remember how much you had to do to uh, learn do two and energy modeling back in the, back in the day, and I think it's a it's a it's a lot more straightforward now. We have better platforms like Energy Plus um, to to use, and it's just just something that is a lot easier for all of us, I think, to understand. Um, the business case part is kind of there's a what's in it for you there, but I want to talk about just very briefly this business case piece because we have it in the title. And then I'm not going to pursue a lot of chatting about the business case as we as we move through this. But you all have you all have businesses, whether you're architecture, engineering, or both, you all have uh, businesses and I'm sure you have business plans uh, uh, of some sort or you probably wouldn't be in business. The business case is really a subset of your business plan. And what you do is you find new um, either uh, products or, or methods or assets that, uh, or just uh, business uh, pieces of your business that you can expand. And uh, you bring that into your business because it supports what you're already doing. And in this case, uh, this is for architects mostly, but um, what's a business case that could support what you're doing as architect? Uh, I would say energy modeling is, and it's one that's being used now. Um, since that 98, 1986, when I told you when Charles Ely was here, we've had lots of training uh, over the years on energy modeling, uh, mostly engineers, but some architects have come, come to that. Um, and now, what I see in this Treasure Valley area is we have a lot of really good energy modelers. That there, it, it is it is business with uh, lots of folks, and I think there's some folks on this um, uh, particular webinar that are probably in that, in that business of, of energy modeling. So, it's it's time has um, a, a come a little bit more, and I know LEED has helped that uh, along because uh, you had to. You, you know, you have to model for a lead to at least to get your energy score and such. So it's helped it along uh, significantly, but there's just been uh, other reasons to take on um, energy modeling as part of your business case, because it does help you design your buildings. 
So let's talk about what's an energy model. And there's a couple things on this particular slide that I want to talk about. First is just uh, what what's up there, the energy model. It's just a, it's a, it's a calculation uh, engine, and you get to put in things into this engine, like the characteristics of your building, your your envelope, your HVAC system, your um, uh, your your site, your climate. Uh, all these types of things, operation schedules are in there. And the better the information that you put in there, the better uh, the result you're going to get in the model. And of course, in an energy model, uh, there's also ways to uh, use it during schematic design. And you're not real deep into it, but it's an iterative approach. And it helps you as you move along um, through your through your design, design development, it helps you understand a little bit more, or in some cases, a lot more, how your systems are functioning and how your building is functioning with your systems and, and the climate. Uh, so it helps you make decisions about, uh, about your design. Down there on the right, it's, uh, there's a, a little photo there or a little uh, image of of the architect's guide to integrating energy modeling. That's the 2012 edition. It's still good. I've downloaded it and I've gone through it. AIA produces it. And I would uh, encourage you to download that and uh, look at that. It, like it's 2012, it's a little older. Things get outdated quickly, but I don't see much in this that is outdated. But as I move forward, you can see here there's a 2019 edition, a little different title, Architect's Guide to Building Performance. And I think this one does a really good job of bringing uh, the architects along in, uh, in, in the energy modeling. And it, re uh, it really gives you the, the right approach that you could be taking um, working with engineers or doing it in-house with your, with your own staff. It gives you a lot of good information. So those two together, um, I think would would be beneficial to you. And then why should we care? The energy model, it, it, it's, it's really an important uh, part of design, but it's not meant to supplement you know, your design. Obviously, yeah, uh, you have a lot of considerations when you're uh, designing a building, but an energy model is a good tool that can be used with uh, throughout your pro the design process to, test various options basically um, and you get to see what the performance of your building is using these different different options and again the more the more information the better you put it in the more you understand obviously how to uh, use the model uh, the energy model whether it's open studio or uh, Sephira or something the more you understand how to use it the better you can enter light or the better you can ha uh, have energy performance in your building and I've got the that other guide up there again, and uh, uh, you can just Google it. You don't really need that URL down there. And I like this statement. It came out of the guide, why, why we should care. And it, um, I like it, so I'm going to read some of it. The architect needn't become a technical expert on energy modeling or the myriad software tools available. Basically, you just need a working understanding of energy modeling and its process and, 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 and the benefits in that. Um, and that can empower you to do what's, uh, what's necessary to make your designs better, better designs. And we'll get to some slides in a minute, and, uh, but we are, I can tell you from experience and uh, those of you that have been practicing for a number of years, uh, 20, 30, 40 years, you've seen architecture change. Since 2000, I've seen it change significantly. Um, and I think for the better, we understand more about our systems, uh, how, our, how our buildings work, what the, uh, what the uh, comfort and care for occupants and the importance of that is. And so the modeling can help us with uh, all of those things and more. Again, uh, why we should care. And there's a couple of up on top here, there's a couple of guides from AIA again, uh, and you might be familiar with these, the D503, the Guide for Sustainable Projects. And actually, if you Google that D503, you'll find the energy modeling contract is uh, is a part of, of that guide, the AI document C401. 
And so a lot of this is already put together for you uh, through the AI, AIA. So you're not, you're not starting from scratch on any of this. Um, there's a lot of reasons, of course, the energy model. And um, we talk, I talked about LEED uh, just a few minutes ago, but you also have codes and, and standards. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. And um, Energy Star, and we're benchmarking buildings now more and more. That's, that's happening. Federal, uh, federal government wants their energies benchmarked. So there's lots of reasons to um, consider doing an energy model. And down at the right, I just showed a, more of a local project. It wasn't a Boise project, but you, it used to be called AIA Top 10, and now it's the Committee on the Environment Top 10. Uh, they've renamed it, but every year the AIA actually uh, uh, has a contest and does and, and posts case studies from the top 10 sustainable projects. Uh, and and this this is one of them, the um, Oregon Zoo. But you can go on there and look at look up any of those at, at uh, any time, and it's actually quite interesting. In, interesting. So a lot of people are taking advantage of. Um, uh, performance modeling, energy performance modeling. And uh, I don't know what the percentage is at this point in time. Uh, it would be interesting to know that, but I know that we have a lot of local architects, I'm talking uh, Idaho architects that are um, uh, using at least uh, daylight modeling, modeling or energy modeling, some form of, of modeling. And then um, we can also look at the energy use indexes to get an idea for our occupancy type, uh, what, what some of the best EUIs would be, and um, maybe some of, the, some of the high and some of the, some of the low here, and that's what we're trying to show here. Different occupancies obviously can have, um, well, different occupancies will have different EUIs. You'd expect the K-12 school to be fairly low because of the, the, the use in K-12, uh, the actual hours and, and use. Uh, offices are, are pretty low now in EUIs. Hospitals are high, you know, retail is high, um, this sort of thing. You can go on to the Energy Star website. And again, I would just suggest that you uh, Google e, uh, EUIs by occupancy type, and you'll probably get to the Energy Star website, and they'll show you what the the median uh, uh, what what the median EUI is for occupancy types. Now, and one of the interesting things I saw when I went in and did that is uh, the median office building in the United States right now is uh, 52.9 as an energy use index, and as you can see there EUI is KBDUs K to use per square foot per year. So it's kind of like a miles per gallon. Um, but office buildings are 52.9. And I remember it's probably been 10, 12 years ago, but that number was more like a 70, 74, 75. And so uh, what I was saying earlier about the times they are changing, it, uh, they're changing pretty rapidly. When, when, when we're going down uh, 20 KBTU on average over a period of about 10 years in a certain occupancy type, that's a, that's a pretty big change. That's, that's uh, pretty nice to see. And you know, materials, methods, uh, design, just the understanding of integrated design. There's a lot of contributors to that. Um, uh, lead to you, uh, the uh, the 2030 challenge with architects obviously has driven a lot of that. Also, uh, I do want to tell you, uh, I love this quote down here because I believe it. Uh, uh, it's absolutely true. Energy is a design topic. It's not a technology topic. Um, and that's from Don Watson at F FAIA. Uh, and I, I really believe that that is true. It should be, uh, energy should be considered part of your design. When I went to school in 1982, University of Idaho, I did a Master's of Architecture up there. No one was thinking energy efficiency. And I mean, really up there, no one was thinking energy efficiency. And just a few years after that, uh, after I graduated, I was invited up to talk about energy efficiency because I was the, I was the guy that was um, uh, looking into it and, and, uh, and doing it. So it's now, it's just ubiquitous. I think the energy efficiency is part of design. I love this um, particular diagram here, Charlie Brown uh, um, 
he uh, he finally succumbed to ALS in, in February of, of this year. But uh, what a great what a great thinker, what a great person, an architect. He was the energy studies and buildings in Oregon. He started that lab, which was really the first integrated design lab in the region. And he really liked to do thought experiments among everything else and, uh, uh, and also to come up with diagrams like this. And so what we're showing you here, and I know some of you, if you've been around a while, you've probably seen this, but again, I, I, I like it because it still explains the uh, integrated process very well. What you see in the middle is that circle with the loads and you have the solid circle on the outside and on the, in, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, inner circle. And the inner circle is supposed to be about 50% of, uh, of the total size of that circle. And the idea is the first thing that you always do Okay, I got to admit somebody, there we go. The first thing you always do, uh, uh, this is the you know, first rule is reduce your loads. Before you start designing any system, you look at how I'm going to configure this building with massing studies, what the climate is, uh, the building use and occupancy, uh, um, uh, uh, the schedule that the schedule is going to be there for the occupancy and such, and then the site and program. If you really take all those things into consideration with a mind to uh, reduce loads, you really you really can. And um, so that was your that's your that's the first thing you need to do. And in order to do that, uh, you really do need to integrate a design, not the standard practice. You need to bring the engineers in uh, sooner. Than, than you would, and energy modeling becomes really a very a key part to doing this uh, because it's an, uh, it becomes an iterative approach to, uh, to design. You wanna be doing a lot of this and, and um, uh, really schematic, this uh, schematic phase, some of this at least. And then what you see there with the optimized systems and the little green square and the dotted outline of the large square, the idea is if you reduce your loads by 50%, well, you can reduce your uh, systems, your HVAC, at least part of those systems, maybe not the ventilation part, but um, uh, the, the energy part, you can reduce maybe by 50% or whatever the percentage is, you can optimize those systems. So I really like this. Uh, I really like this slide from Charlie. So we're gonna talk about what you can model, who models, how can you use, and when to model, what to model with. And what questions can a model answer is kind of the first slide that we, we look at here. And it's not real readable, but everything in the building, your heating, your, uh, your cooling, your, your equipment, your lighting, your pumps, your fans, uh, they can all be looked at, heat rejection, uh, uh, energy recovery, they can all be looked at uh, in with an energy model. So it's really quite powerful what you can do with an energy model. Now, again, data in equals data out. So you have to make sure uh, 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 at what phase you're in and how consistently you're doing this and how well you're doing the energy model. I, I, there's, there's a lot of factors in there and, and, and doing it correct. So categories are three main categories of uh, building simulation is daylight simulation, energy, and then computational fluid dynamics simulation. Of those, I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of them. Of those, daylight sim simulation, I think is done uh, a lot more now on buildings than uh, obviously than it was in the past. And there's some really good programs out there, Radiance, uh, Sephira, um, there, there's some, there some good, uh, there's some other ones we'll talk about later, but there's some good programs. You can look at the quantitative issues in lighting. In other words, how many foot candles am I putting down on a space throughout the space? Um, you can look at qualitative things like glare. This is, uh, I believe, radiance here because uh, radiance is very good at looking at qual uh, qualitative lighting and, and uh, it points out that the, these windows are a source of glare or will be a source of glare at certain times if the blinds aren't closed, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can learn a lot by these uh, daylight uh, simulations, both quantitatively and qualitatively. And then you can do energy simulations. And over on the right, the, uh, the chart is just showing uh, monthly EUI breakdown for a certain building. I don't know what building it is, but yeah, 
you can just predict, you know, what you're going to use, what type of energy, uh, heating, cooling, uh, system energy over uh, a 12 month a 12 month period, and then all obviously, uh, or at least to me, it's obvious. Uh, once your building is in place and built, uh, um, it helps to actually track your energy use, and then you can even adjust your um, energy model. That's one of the great advantages of doing the energy model during design. Uh, your operators, your building operators can use it um, uh, for uh, pretty much the lifetime of the building as long as they continue to update building characteristics over time. Um, and if things get off track, it's pretty easy to see that way. So there's environmental variables in your uh, simulation and there's, of course, there's equipment variables all, also. Um, and the equipment variables is, uh, they are, uh, when I look at that chart to the right, that I, th I think they're the ones that are informing that information because you want to look at your whole building uh, energy use over time. Then the CFD, um, don't see as much. Uh, I remember remember having uh, Peter Anspa from ARAP come here years ago, and he, um, he was a CFD specialist, and he told a great story about uh, falling water, Frank Lloyd. Rights uh, design, and that um, they were having problems with moisture in the house. Go figure. <laughs> you build build a house over water, and maybe you have a, a little bit of moisture in the house. But this was a, a newer problem. It hadn't it hadn't been there through the life uh, of of the house, and so they did a CFD model of falling water, and it basically told them that they needed an opening up uh, 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 natural ventilation or fan. Uh, up in a upper story bathroom, and then that would pull the air through and um, uh, remedy this um, this problem with moisture. And when they went up there, and they actually found that Wright had already designed it in, it, had, it just had been covered over over the years, and that's why the, the building was no longer performing. So, but CFD. Um, it almost to me, it almost takes a PhD or someone that just works in see it, uh, computational fluid dynamics, but it's it's very powerful. And if you're doing natural ventilation, it can really help to uh, have, have a CFD model. You can also use a physical model and uh, or, and a wind tunnel and such uh, um, that, that that can work. As far as the workflow, um, you've got the, your pyramid here with the architect on uh, on top, but I don't think that uh, that's what's important here. You got the energy analyst, the mechanical engineer, and the architect, and um, you know basically who does what or, or what can you do as an architect? Well, we got three levels of understanding that we've identified here, and the first one is just that as an architecture firm, you do have an understanding of. Um, the modeling process, what types of questions you can ask, you hire it out to a third world, a third world, hey, yeah, that would work, a third party modeler, uh, energy modelers. And I, again, there are uh, folks in Boise that are really good with energy models now. Um, so you can hire this out. You don't have to do it within your firm, but you should be aware of the different types of models that are out there. And I think most students coming out of architectural school now are aware at least of some of these, uh, some of these models and they have used um, some of them to some extent. And so that's, that's kind of helpful. You might want to find someone on your staff and go to a level two at exploration where you have some uh, in-house modeling skills and uh, uh, maybe maybe the day, maybe on daylighting, uh, but enough skills that you can do maybe the schematic uh, work and some of the first work, laying out the look project, understanding what zones are daylight zones, what are, you want to be daylight zones, which uh, which areas of the building don't need to be, and and such so schematic design type of stuff, and then um, you would hand off again to uh, an. In, uh, engineering team, most likely. You don't have to be an engineer to be a good modeler. Um, um, Jake, who worked at the lab here for quite a few years, became a super, uh, super modeler, and he's now running a crew of about uh, 12 uh, in, in energy models over, over in Portland, and he's, he's an architectural grad. He's not an engineer. You don't have to be an engineer. Level three, though, uh, you would have a full-time analyst able to do HVAC analysis as well as architectural. 
Um, it's more of an integrated uh, workflow model and full service firms uh, generally have this. But that's up, it's up to obviously to you decide, and this is that business case piece again, how much of this do you wanna bring into your organization, to your firm, uh, uh, and how much do you wanna outsource basically. But you still need to be in charge at the architect. You still need to understand what it is you need for an energy model and how it's going to affect your design. Some of the uses for energy modeling, yeah, um, and uh, you can see them here, and I'm gonna talk about them one by one so I won't list them off. Um, and then uh, the, the Swiss Army knife, the, the building energy management, uh, and you can see all of the, uh, all, all of the uh, things that fall into the, that um, uh, modeling realm and what you, can, what you can get out of modeling. I mean, everything from asset ratings to uh, MNB to uh, HVAC and con uh, control design. So January 1st, you're gonna have the International Energy Conservation Code. And uh, a lot of you that know, me know that I've and encodes the standards for quite a, uh, quite a few years since, well, actually since 1986. Um, less so now that I'm, uh, uh, that because I'm at the Integrated Design Lab and that's not my uh, body of work at this point in time, but you'll have this January 1st of 2018 IECC. Um, you can use, obviously for, uh, you can use, you can use ComCheck to show compliance, for example, uh, and that's written right into the, the uh, uh, code ComCheck was developed for the IECC. But ComCheck is not a modeling tool. Uh, it never has been a compliance tool on, only. Uh, you can use an energy model to comply with the IECC. So if you're doing an energy model, you shouldn't need to do uh, ComCheck. And that's something you need to discuss with your uh, building department as you get in as you get into your design uh, but it's in the code that uh, energy model uh, can can be used of course we use it for lead compliance and you can get up to 18 points uh, uh, for energy efficiency so that's that's pretty cool that's a lot of points and uh, in, in in lead based on the performance of your uh, performance of your building of course, uh, you should be benchmarking a, a, a higher benchmark if, if you have better energy efficiency also. So that's something to think about. And then let's talk a little bit about design assistance. Um, again, from your first schematic design to uh, um, uh, the final design through design development, you can use these energy models and that's that is the way to use them. It should be an iterative approach. I know I've mentioned that before, but that's really critical to, I think, to um, models being, energy models uh, being a design tool for you because they're a tool in your, in your tool chest that, as well as part of your, they can be part of your business case. So use them. Uh, that second design book I showed you from the AIA or modeling book, uh, Energy Performance Modeling Book from AIA, I took this out of there. I liked it because it lists the um, single aspect simulations and whole building energy simulations. It's really a good guide. I called it a book, but it's really a good guide um, and you should download it, I think. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty thick. I think it's 91 pages. Um, uh, but we look at here at the lab massing, uh, massing studies. We, we can do massing studies for you, um, ventilation, daylight studies, energy efficiency, uh, programming, and then feasibility studies. So all of these things uh, can be done in the, uh, and, uh, to support the design realm, uh, the design of the building. And when we're looking at massing, daylight, and energy, what we have here are four different boxes that encapsulate the same square footage. They're all two stories. But as you can see there, there's different, um, uh, different model EUIs on each of them. And I will say here, and you all know this to be true, that the, the model and the actual don't always come out to um, be the same. But the better you do the model, the easier it is uh, to figure out how to pull the actual um, built building into that um, EUI realm that you model. So that's, that's kind of an 
uh, something to think about there. And you can see in this case, because of daylighting, I imagine the one on the right, the thin plan view uh, uh, uses the less energy, least amount of energy has the lowest EUI. Um, uh, kind, of, kind of interesting, right? You can use this for conceptual design talked about this a minute ago, but if I uh, really am looking at uh, doing daylighting, I, I really need to understand the spaces that I want daylight and the, uh, the occupancy of those daylight spaces, how high my cubicles are gonna be, the window window height, the shading. There's a lots of uh, considerations there, blinds if I, if I need them for glare, lots and lots of considerations there. All of those things can actually be modeled, um, which is pretty cool with the, uh, with the software programs that we have now. And then we can do feasibility studies. And this is more of a CFD, computational fluid dynamic, dynamic model here of this particular building. And what they're really trying to do is understand, well, if I do night flush or stack ventilation or constant velocity, um, and, and I have a high performance um, uh, uh, envelope, uh, with a certain amount of heat gain rate, what do each of these things, the night flush stack and constant velocity, what do they contribute as far as uh, BTUs for cooling of this building? And uh, that's that's just you know, great to know. I mean, uh, why, why would you, in my opinion, why would you design a building to naturally ventilate and not understand if it's going to work or if it has the possibility of, of working properly, right? Um, because if you do that, then you're going to uh, missize maybe the uh, HVAC equipment in there. And then we have here at the IDL, we have all these tools. We have a couple of generations of tools that you can use to do feasibility studies. And all you have to do is contact us and we'll um, not just give you the tool and walk away, but we can teach you and show you how to, how to use it. So we have heat gain calculators, cross ventilation, stack ventilation, thermal mass, balance point, passive solar, and even earth tube, which uh, I was surprised to see um, because I hadn't heard of earth tubes in a long time. Uh, um, came out of Montana uh, about 30 years ago is where I first, uh, first heard about them, but interesting. Uh, so we do have, we, we do have on spreadsheets all of these different tools. So please contact us if you're interested. Now, uh, more on this design assistance. This is uh, more like schematic design again on your envelope. We have a baseline and we have a baseline plus shading. Um, we have daylight controls plus shading and we have a high performance envelope. Um, so bottom line, you, you, really need a high performance envelope always as part of that should be that should be part of your design that's 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 what i'm going to tell you that's that's a critical part of every every design but if you take these four and then you plot them out and you look at eui comparison charts and uh, the first one has everything in there, heating, lighting, fans, equipment, and cooling. And then we break out cooling and heating for those four designs. I'm gonna go back to that just for a second. Um, so the baseline shading, uh, uh, daylight controls plus shading and high performance envelope. And you can start to look at um, where you're gonna get the best savings, the most savings on heating and on cooling. And you can see obviously the high performance envelope to the right uh, is the is the winner for the the heating side on cooling though you need that you really need the shading because you don't want to let the uh, solar energy into the building in the first place right that's just uh, almost I think probably common sense now but you can start to lay this out and see it graphically like this um, this may convince you it may convince your client to do something different and then we have um, uh, eight more. Uh, sketches here, and we're looking at uh, uh, three-foot daylight windows, four by four, uh, light shelves, roller shades, all, all of these. Once you set up a model, that's what's great about it. You can start playing around. So once you put in all the essential uh, base characteristics, you know, of your building, your your site, your climate, your orientation, your mass, and, and such, you can start playing around with these other things uh, that are on here. Your shed roof that, to let in uh, daylighting, uh, some baffles for uh, ventilation, and um, 
uh, cubicle height, you can even look at that. And lo and behold, using the energy model, you can actually uh, look at what optimum case is for that particular building. And that's a pretty powerful, that's a pretty powerful tool in, in that case. So you know that, uh, you know, and I need that, I need those uh, lower cubicles for the, the for the daylighting design and such. And it, it's just very, very helpful that way. Passive design, I think I'm going back. Yep. No, going backwards again. Sorry, folks. Um, <laughs> um, I'm using my mouse here. Again, just mouse. Um, this here, and, and uh, again, schematic design, what type of HVA system am I going to put in? And um, you see at the top the conventional system, the VAV, the ducted variable air volume system, um, versus other system types, and how you can get the uh, the uh, with the other other type, the uh, load down that uh, BTUs, the peak cooling uh, peak cooling loads, and and handling it uh, with more efficient types of uh, uh, systems there. I think that was a rebuilding slide. And then you can do HVAC analysis. This, you're not going to be able to read this slide, but basically all of them in the uh, the uh, the taller part of the graph and the, and the lighter are um, not what we're looking at. We're looking at zonal heat pumps on the right with those five there and different um, uh, different attributes or, di or different components to the zonal heat pumps such, such as heat recovery, uh, ventilation, and, and such. And anyway, you can begin to optimize your HVAC system. And actually, you can you can begin and end that optimization through a, a good model. You can really you can really get it down. It's just, it is a it, it is a science. Our buildings are, um, are can can be turned into a science project as, as well as a design project, and it, and it can work. So, conceptual design, design assistant. Got the measurement verification uh, we're looking at now, and um, the energy retrofit process. Uh, it can help you with that. You can create a calibrated rated energy model, uh, and I talked about that earlier. So if you're going to uh, just a little bit, if if you are going to do a retrofit on a building and um, you do an energy model, you can start calibrating based on the actual energy use of that building. Uh, and the, the, you, uh, this is where the uh, submeters at the IDL come in handy. You want to use our tool loan library to start checking fan energy and, uh, and other things to calibrate um, that your energy model. But once you get it calibrated with the actual, then you can start um, um, putting in the new equipment that you want to design, the new control systems, the new HVAC system, and you can actually get a very good idea of how they're going to operate in that building. So it's um, it's it's pretty powerful to use it as a tool for uh, retrofits, but it does require that calibration. So you can use it for new construction, and you got the uh, ASHRAE uh, 90.1 pin XP for that, and then the existing building the ASHRAE. Uh, guideline 14 uh, that you can use for that. Engineers are familiar with this. As architects, you can be familiar with those also. Um, the electric doesn't show up here, and I couldn't make it happen, but the gas does. So these two lines represent um, uh, uh, gas, uh, natural gas use. Uh, this is a, being used as uh, for building operations or as a commissioning or retro commissioning tool. And if you if you have a model and um, you have calibrated it to your building, let's say, and let's say you calibrate it to your building every year or two as you uh, as you recommission the building, um, you can look at your profiles that your model shows, which is in the dashed line there, and then you can look at your actual use. And if they're not matching up or if they're wildly different, um, you can start. You should begin to ask your question. Uh, the question of why and uh, start looking at uh, what 
what's changed in your building, you know, at, at my, uh, my hours changed, you know, uh, my operation hours changed, uh, my occupancy uh, changed, um, you know, COVID and no one's in the building, obviously that's a big change, right? But I remember in one building here locally here a number of years ago, I was sitting with the operators and the engineer and um, uh, they had this online. We could just sit in the conference room like I'm in now and they could look at the whole building online, uh, the actual energy that was um, uh, being utilized at that moment in time in the building. And that we could also adjust uh, uh, fan energy around, uh, around the building. We could just set points and fan energy around the building and doing it. Um, we saved just in about like 20 minutes, a half an hour, we probably saved uh, uh, somewhere around 10, 10 to 15% of fan energy is what we estimated. So there's, there's lots you can do here uh, on the operation sides too. And that's, to me, that's a critical part. Uh, design is critical, but you know, you turn these building over, buildings over to people and they don't know how to operate it. If they can't see some visuals here, um, they're probably not gonna operate it uh, as uh, optimized as it should be. And then um, we have incentive programs. And this is back to Idaho Power Efficiency Programs. They program for retrofits, new construction, custom efficiency for uh, commercial industrial uh, buildings. You can take advantage of, uh, of all of these and get some great incentives from Idaho Power. And you can get assistance from, the, uh, from us if, it's, uh, if we're, we're, we want to see you save energy. So if, uh, if you're going to save energy, uh, Idaho Power usually signs off on our, our assistance. And we have contracts with them uh, every year and have been for uh, quite a few years. So uh, get a hold of us and find out more about these incentive programs. Go on to the Idaho Power website, find out a little more if you haven't, and um, uh, get with the program because they, these, these really help. I know um, these lunch and learns are a great place for us to kind of advertise that um, Idaho Power does this, it, the lab does this. Um, and we usually get, uh, after a lunch and learn, we usually get uh, one or two firms talking to us and maybe a, a project going. And it's a good thing. And a lot of times it's firms that have done projects in the past, worked with the lab, worked with Idaho Power in the past, but it's been two or three years and you just kind of forget, you know, um, that we're here. But um, it's, uh, I think it's a pretty valuable service. So get a hold of us. And then there's a medley of tools out there. And I don't know all of them. I'm too old to know them all. You'd think I would, but uh, I know Equest and Radiance. So I actually know about all these that are that are up there. Uh, energy Plus is the big energy one that's being used right now. These are probably engineer focused. Damon's really good with Energy Plus. Energy Plus is a platform or an engine, and then you uh, you buy programs uh, or you uh, download programs. You don't have to buy all of them, um, like Open Studio to actually do your you know, energy modeling. And um, uh, there's there's other programs there. And I do know, um, you know, Mike Hatton's been over here several times, uh, a number of times at training. He's from Boise, and he's an engineer and he's an energy modeler. That's that's his probably his biggest um, uh, claim. To, claim the fame is a great energy model. And I remember asking him one time, which model is the best? This was even before Energy Plus was a real thing here. Um, and it's a platform, it's, uh, but uh, I, you know, is it Equest, is it Trace, is it HAP? And um, uh, is it a train system? I mean, I asked him this question and he said, well, you know what, what? It depends on the energy modeler and what they know best and how, uh, uh, if they're very thorough with their inputs and they really understand what an input means in the energy model. So there is that, um, you have to be experienced in energy modeling, but that experience comes with obviously uh, getting into it, going to the BSUG uh, uh, lessons will help. And uh, again, we can help a little bit with that too. And then architect for focus for daylight and energy, there's Ecotech, Radiance for daylight, and I know that's used a lot. Uh, Green Building Studio and Compton are, uh, are, are both used by, uh, all used by architects. And then uh, the energy stuff, uh, Energy Plus with Open Studio, that's a, that's a hybrid basically, and uh, uh, 
the, the lighting uh, IES virtual environment uh, works well. And then Diva for Rhino and Grasshopper for daylighting, um, uh, Loop 5, Passive for energy. There's a lot of, um, there's just a lot of good um, programs out there. But as Mike Hatton said, it takes experience to make those programs work well. You can look at a lot of different um, uh, programs. They're not, these are not all free. They're on the uh, energy uh, and renewable uh, resource, uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy website, uh, doe.gov uh, is another way to get their energy codes.gov. We'll get you there too. Um, but there's a list of all of these different programs and um, they're not, this is just a list. Um, so buyer beware. I, and uh, the ones I listed on the on the other slides, I think we're pretty, or uh, we're pretty knowledgeable about those, and we know that they actually can can work well. But um, uh, if you want to look, go on go on that site and look. And uh, I am there with this, and I would take questions if there's a, no no mute on and. Uh, Stop this share here. And Can I have a question? Yes. Does the IDL do the computational fluid dynamics? No, no um, we do not at this time do CFD. Now we are working with um, uh, a couple of engineers, one down here, Ralph Ludwig and uh, Tao Zing from Moscow, that they're uh, CFD experts. And so we probably could answer questions about it uh, uh, through them, but um, we don't do CFD modeling, no. And for the most part, we don't do full energy models uh, uh, because phase three of Idaho Power would take us up to $4,000 and a full energy model is gonna cost more than 4,000, but we can cost here. Um, uh, Depending on Idaho Power's approval, we can cost share up to that four thousand dollars, which is still a pretty good, pretty good deal. Or if you're doing the model yourself and you need, uh, you have questions on CFD, we, uh, or uh, probably some other aspect of energy models or Open Studio, how to use that, uh, we can we can help with that. Good question, thank you. And I had chat here. Okay, that was some of that from the first. We had, uh, thank you for telling me that <laughs> that presentation then wasn't off the uh, computer. And um, Dylan said, if you please fill out the poll. We would appreciate the feedback. And we're just about, we've got five minutes left. Any more questions? All right. Well, I thank you for coming and attending the session today. There was folks on here, recognize most of you, not all of you, and I um, appreciate your uh, your attending today. Uh, if you have any questions at all, just um, you can you can email me at klbaker at uidaho.edu or you know Damon or Dylan. Dylan's the lighting person. Damon's the uh, more of the open studio energy plus. Uh, person. So uh, let us know. Thank you very much.